time for Lickin' On Lending. Welcome, everybody. Good to have you with us. Welcome to Lickin' On Lending, a weekly mortgage market update providing up-to-the-minute information on interest rates, loan programs, and hot industry news, all related to the mortgage industry. Brought to you by Transformational Mortgage Solutions. To participate in today's program, our guest call in line is 646 716 4972. Now, here's your host of Lickin' on Lending, David Lickin. Let's begin. Folks, I am excited to have Sarah Knuckle here with Candor. For those of you that listened to the podcast that we recorded at their event at the National Mortgage Banking Conference in Nashville, you've already met her and kind of feel for the brilliance in this team. And I'm really excited to have Sarah come to the microphone today and just have her here because there was so much you were sharing, Sarah. And so welcome to the podcast. Good to have you back. Thank you very much, David. Glad to be here. For those that may not know who you are, if you could give us a little bit of a background of your journey to where you're at today. You play a key role there, Candor. Tell us how you got there. Oh, certainly. Well, um, my passion has always been data and analytics and my entire career um, from undergraduate uh, degree onward was really around technology and data. Um, and I started out uh, focused more in the secondary space of mortgage. So worked for a company called Loan Performance, which eventually got bought by CoreLogic. And then um, I was at a place called Digital Risk, uh, which oh, did yeah. forensic audits, but always working with data. Um, but the funny thing about working with data is it's only as powerful as uh, your understanding of the business that it's coming from, right? So right. I had always liked to sit between business and technology. So I went and got an MBA a number of years ago. Um, and when I came out of school, decided to consult for a while um, and uh, built a data and analytics practice in Atlanta, consulting for many different companies, including Candor Technology, which was one of my clients. And um, I, of course, knew the founders from my digital risk uh, and core logic days. So I actually already knew them, but, you know, they became my client at that time. And then finally, uh, this year, 2022, I came on full time to join them in building a data and analytics company for Candor. Well, we're so excited to have you here and sharing the vision and what you're really talking, what you're developing there, which is really so exciting. But it's so much more than just the technology. Your technology in and of itself Sarah is quite, it's really quite astounding. It's so well designed that it does underwriting and it is been in doing it in such a way that you're able to re obtain a patent on it. But again, the company Candor is something much more than just technology. And I want, we touched on this some when we were doing that last interview, but I'm really excited about sharing that. And Mark, you're going to really appreciate this. By the way, Mark Helm, welcome to the interview. I'm sorry I didn't introduce you earlier. Mark Helm is joining me on the interview. Mark, good to have you here. Glad to be here and glad to listen to Sarah today. This is going to be outstanding. Yeah. Well, the part, especially the part which you're about to ready to hear, Mark, which is something near and dear and is something that you're working in your doctorate degree on. Um, but it's really the health of the organization, what makes it so unique. So tell us a little bit about what makes Candor special beyond the technology, Sarah. I think it, it's first it was founded with a very specific purpose and all decisions in terms of what we make, how we go to market and even who we hire and who works here um, all come from a really central decision. Um, the whole purpose of the company was to enable lenders to make the best decision possible at any uh, point in the lending life cycle. And, and quality was really um, our focus, make a quality loan, um, enable quality decisions. And so that being the case, um, a couple of things are very important to us at Candor, uh, information, um, excellence, uh, but, but the truth is also very important. And that's actually one of the hardest challenges in mortgage is, is the data I'm looking at true and correct because that will influence the quality of my decision. Um, so anyway, so the truth has always been very important to us. And um, we, like, we have a little saying, uh, the truth is our friend. And um, we have really tried to uh, staff the company with people who also believe that who have a pursuit of truth and a pursuit of excellence and a commitment to the greater good. Um, because we do believe that the, the company and its mission for quality, it's not just gonna make life better for lenders trying to make a loan. It's gonna make you know, the capital markets better. The uh, economies that are impacted by um, our capital market, that's the largest um, in the world actually for mortgage. And then um, home ownership too. 
um, the impact to the average American and their access to credit. So it's it's funny how something really tiny ends up having um, like this ripple effect to all these other pieces. Yeah. When we first started talking, Sarah, I always thought of Candor as the ability to get greater productivity out of your underwriters. And that's how I first started viewing it. But it is quite a bit more. It certainly does that. But it's quite a bit more. Expound on that. Uh, yes. Well, um, it's quite common for people to have noticed the productivity um, that it brings first, especially the last two years um, when we had such high volumes and people were just looking for a way to cope. Um, and our technology performed exceptionally well. I mean, you had, you know, five times increase in files you could process a day um, or underwrite a day. And you had, um, you know, massive increases and in pull through all that kind of stuff. But um, those were actually not the company's goals when it set out to develop our, our artificial intelligence for underwriting. We call it Cognitech. That's what the platform is. So yeah, so Cognitech wasn't, wasn't built to um, reduce costs and increase speed initially. It was built to simply make a loan you could trust, make sure it was high quality, that the Going data the was really the data. Yeah, it, it was based in truth. That was the whole point. What it turns out is when you do that, you um, have this dramatic impact on the speed, though, because uh, up until the invention of our technology, the only way that you could um, do that analysis was with humans. And so, you know, humans can only work so fast, especially if you want them to be at their best. And so no matter how much automation and digitization you add to the loan making process, you still have this essential human piece. Um, that was really necessary. And um, what we've been able to do is take a large part of the human pieces, especially the, the tedious ones, um, things that need to be executed repeatedly, but to a high um, level of consistency and, and accuracy, we've been able to take care of those. And so now you have your humans freed up to do the even harder tasks, um, the really sophisticated um, looks, um, and then you don't have them, you know, doing all this tedious work. And that's where you get all these productivity improvements and cost improvements. From my viewpoint, having been involved with it for a number of years, and I know with the pedigree you have out there, Sarah, with uh, digital risk and loan performance and core logic, that's about as heavy duty as you can get. <laughs> and one of the things I've always focused on, it seems to be that no matter how much you try, try to take people out of the formula for dealing when you deal with technology, they still are very important a point in that, and you've already alluded to that in this conversation about people and their involvement, but how big a challenge is that as, as a day-to-day -day in dealing with the people aspect of making your technology work, and how does that play into the type of people that you hire and what kind of workforce you have at Kendor to meet those goals and needs, because it takes, uh, you know, it takes technical people, but it takes people that can communicate and get on the right level to make sure you're getting all the pieces out that you need to make your technology work the best it possibly can. Oh, yes, you, you are right. It takes a wide variety of people um, with different expertise. Technology really only being one part of all of that. Um, and to what you said earlier, too, about um, you, you can never really take the humans completely out of the process. That is completely true. I, I don't expect us to ever not have humans um, in the mortgage manufacturing process, but I do expect us to be at a state where we can fully empower those humans to use their time and skills most effectively by making as much of the um, decision-making process automation, digitization as possible already done for them. Um, so to that effect, in order for us to figure out how to deliver that, we have brought into our company um, people from all different parts of the mortgage industry who've been in many different roles. So we have, um, for one thing, we have a robust team of underwriters that are on our product development team. So they don't actually underwrite mortgages, they write product specifications and they test the product too. Um, but they have to work collaboratively with people who have been processors and loan officers because we have to think about um, the process, your technology is only as good as it can interact with the business process it's trying to affect. So we have people um, from all different parts of the process. Um, 
And now that we've been getting into loan quality services as well, um, which is outside fulfillment, we've also started talking to um, folks that work in that space. Some of our underwriters have been QC underwriters in the past as well. Um, we have some people joining our staff who have managed um, QC in different organizations before. So it, it takes this 360 degree view to really get it right, I think, and to try and deliver the most value. Small follow-up question to that. I know that being a technology company and you have a lot of metrics on many things, but do you have metrics surrounding the performance of your and your end product to determine very quickly whether the focus should be to make it bigger, better, faster, should be on the technology side, or is it on that management of that human side we just talked about? I don't have metrics around, I guess it would, you would, I think what you're asking is what's the next area that's going to deliver the most value? Is it the human experience part and then interaction or is it? That the, would be a byproduct. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. You're right. Or is it, is it the technology itself? I honestly think actually the, um, the more you focus on the process, um, the better. Now, granted, we the technology has to be pristine. Like the the way that this the um the engine comes to its conclusions has to be flawless. The way we um, get data um, into our system off of documents or other sources has to be flawless. So all of that has to be um, state of the art, up to date. But the the process is really key um, because what what when you're talking about an underwrite, what you're talking about is a content analysis problem. Those are, those are nuanced. Um, you know, most uh, technology solutions, when you program for something, you have a known outcome space. So you know all the possible input parameters and that defines your outcome space. The challenge with an underwrite is the outcome space is infinite. Yes. There are infinite paths that a loan can take. And so um, that now, now, and you're asking a human to now interact in that space, even with the support of technology, um, so the, the, the human experience, um, and how you help them come to conclusions about that content analysis and what it means, that's really important. All right. Good. One of the things that I enjoy so much, first of all, let me go back. One of the things I value so much about Candor is the fact you underwrite very well. You have an insurance product. So if the fact if the company does, if, if, if the technology misses something along the way and a repurchase is required, you have insurance around that. What's even more impressive, you've never had to use any of the insurance for any of the decisions you've made. And I picked this up when I was talking to your founder, Tom Showalter, and there is, there's so much more about what goes into this technology it's really the people. And I look at people. It people is what makes up your organi any organization. You guys have a unique hiring practice. And it starts with Tom, which with whom you yeah, have a yeah. very unique relationship. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I do. Yeah. So um, if you hadn't mentioned already, Tom is my father. Yeah. And so, and I've I've not just been raised by him. I actually have had the pleasure of working with him on and off throughout my entire career. Um, and while he has actually been one of the more demanding bosses I've ever had, I've learned uh, tremendous amounts from him. Um, but one of the ways, uh, one of the things I've learned is the way he views hiring people and what he's looking for. And that has um, inadvertently permeated our organization. Um, so everyone that's been hired uh, into Candor has had an interview with Tom. So nobody that gets hired impressive. without talking to him. And I think you picked up in our in our last interview that um, Tom also talks to everyone in the company every week. So mm -hmm. we're I think we're up to, we're getting close to eighty people now, um, and and we still have a team meeting every week, and everybody gets to chat with Tom. So yeah, it, um, yeah. It, it, some of the questions when he's hiring people. This is what I found most interesting, Mark was some of the questions that he ends up asking people are not your normal questions. And it's, go into that a little bit, explain, give us some insights of what those meetings or those questions sound like. Yeah, well, one of the things he's always interested in is if somebody considers themselves a pathfinder, a problem solver, or um, an execution person. Because um, you need all three, but they perform differently under different circumstances. And so depending on what problem you're going to put them on, you know, each of those different personas may or may not be appropriate. And so he always tries to understand when he's hiring someone, which one they are and what role they're going into 
because that might um, impact their effectiveness. And what, what Tom is a huge fan of is um, putting people into positions where um, they will be able to leverage their skills most effectively and have the greatest chance for success. Also growth, because growth is important. Um, that's another thing he's a big believer in is he wants everyone in the company to have a path of continued growth and development, um, you know, both in their hard skills and soft skills, I guess, is some of the ways you might phrase it. Um, and so we've also had some really interesting um, promotional paths of folks within the company um, who've learned different skill sets and, and moved into different roles. It's actually been incredibly encouraging to see. Um, but yeah, it's an unusual approach to interviewing. Um, we also kind of take an approach where um, each interviewer is focusing on something a little bit different. Um, and we communicate a lot so that we kind of try to get a holistic person or a whole holistic picture of this person, not just what is their skill set and can they do this job, but um, is this kind of a company right for them? Because we're still in a high growth phase. We have to be very flexible because we're um, constantly evaluating the market that we're in and the opportunity and making sure that we're heading in the right direction. And sometimes we have to adjust our, our course. And so um, people need to be uh, interested in being in that kind of a place. If they're not, they might not be happy here. This might not be the best, best place for them. So. Yeah. One of the things that Tom has said to me in my very first interview with him, he says, mortgage lane, he says, I'm a, I, I come out of NASA. I've worked at NASA and I, his background is just so fascinating how he helps select which fighter pilots had the greatest probability of being successful in the military as a pilot. It went from there into NASA, which one of the astronauts would have the greatest probability of being successful there. So having predictable outcomes, looking at people is one of the things he specialized in. And it was fascinating. And he said, Dave, when I, one of the first statements I ever met was that the, the first statements he ever made that was so profound was he says, everyone thinks rocket scientists being a rocket scientist is complicated. It's actually simple compared to under our working in the mortgage industry. The diff, the variables are so vast and they're so diverse that could, that causes for the outcome to be so could go so many different directions. How have you guys begun to navigate? How can you give us insights when you're navigating through some of the complexities of the mortgage industry? How, in fact, you have done that through technology? Um, well, we use something called expert systems. Um, it's a form of artificial intelligence where it you you are programming into the machine the critical thinking of an expert. Um, this is different from purely a uh, rules engine. Mm -hmm. um, the challenge with rules engines is that you once you take a branch of a certain path, you're, you're on it. That's your branch. You can't then switch over to another one. Um, so it's very linear. You have to know the full length of the path before you build it. Um, and so you have a limited number of outcomes. And um, what we've been able to do is layer critical thinking um, in the machine so that it can evaluate a picture holistically um, like I can see if there's something unusual on um, a bank statement over here in terms of um, a large deposit or something moving over here, then does this other piece of information on the application really make sense anymore? So it doesn't have to think through the problem linearly. Um, so that's one of the things we've been able to do. The other thing is that um, the, the machine is constantly deepening its problem solving capabilities. Um, we have a thing called a pivot point, which is how we measure the thinking ability um, of Cognitech. And um, we describe a pivot point as whenever the machine encounters an anomaly, it has to resolve. And um, to date, it, it's over 60,000 pivot points um, oh. are in the system. It grows at about 1,000 a month. Um, I'd have to check with the product team to see where the latest number's at, but it, it grows at about 1,000 a month. And um, every time it does that, what it means is it can handle a more complex scenario, or it can do even more cross-checking of something over here might be related to something over here. Um, and I just want to do the, does it make sense check? Because there's, there's underwriting to the guidelines, which is very important. Right. But the other thing that human underwriters do that I think is hard for folks to quantify is they do a lot of what we call beyond the guidelines work. 
And it's um, these checks around, do certain things make sense? Does it make sense that you live over a thousand miles from your employer if I don't know if you're a remote worker, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so the human underwriter catches that. Most machine solutions do not, but Candor does. And so, I mean, that's that's been our approach. Positively and more one in a form of a comment. Uh, this has been fascinating, but I will tell you that you have broken the code on something that most technology companies haven't. You have not left out the human perception of that and human concept as you built your technology. And the very idea that you've got so many pivot points have been handled inside an analytical system. If you just take a mere fraction of those and think if you were depending on humans to do it where you'd be today, it'd be mighty tough and a very complicated decision. And I think it's uh, what you've done is something that uh, is going to bring value, not just to what you're doing today, but multitudes of other possibilities inside the uh, mortgage space. And I also see some uh, servicing uh, relative intuitive intuitive things that, that I think would be very great for you to get involved with in your business, because I've just been fascinated by listening to this today, and uh, you're so on point with so many things that are going to make a make a difference in our industry. And uh, with the kind of pedigree you got, I'm excited what you're going to go through in the future because you've taken in the human aspect, and and that's not usually done this way. Which well, really gets <laughs> yeah, which opens up the question: What is the vision of Candor? I I think this is part which really starts getting exciting. Your background, digital risk, gives us some insights into it. You so explain that and how you're carrying that into Candor. Ah, yes. Well, um, having been at Digital Risk, got to learn a lot about. Um, how loans perform when they have defects. Um, and we did a lot of, and well, we had, first of all, we had um, hundreds of thousands of loans um, to use for analysis. And so we ended up doing a lot of predictive analytics. Um, I helped Tom build um, what some people may have heard of called um, Veritas, which right. was a decision platform that could predict um, the behavior or the performance of a loan. Um, uh, down to a very high level of, of accuracy and with a lot of nuance. It wasn't just a, will it perform or not? It's um, if it doesn't perform, uh, well, first of all, will it perform or not? But then if it doesn't perform, what does the solution look like? Because um, resolving a, a defaulting loan um, is, it requires very different solutions depending on the situation and depending on your objectives. Um, so there's all different kinds of data science I can talk about. I can talk about um, something called optimization that has different objective functions. Um, there's something called segmentation analysis that lets you um, understand. We find it very useful for understanding um, different groups of humans and their behavior. Um, but that's the kind of stuff I got to play with there. And the beauty about being at Candor um, is that now that we have machines performing underwrites, we have even more data and more granular data available about the underwrite. Um, we call what we collect off the loan during the underwrite, the loan DNA. And I liken it to when I think it was Watson and Crick discovered DNA that the double helix. Yeah. Um, actually, I think they stole that discovery. I think that's what's commonly referred to now. <laughs> but, but anyways, when they, when when the double helix and DNA was discovered, we could finally start analyzing what made humans. And um, it was always there. It's just mm -hmm. nobody knew about it. Um, and today, you can test your own genes for all kinds of stuff. Um, and you know, then you can make decisions about what you should do based on that information. Well, this data has always existed. It was just never captured about the loan. And the underwriter would know it. The underwriter would have a very detailed idea of the different income. Um, and employment um, sources and the asset breakdown. But as soon as he was finished working on the file, all of his notes and all of his, his work and due diligence, where did it go? You know, maybe it's on his laptop somewhere, his home computer, a scratch pad, but it's not in the loan file. And it's now not, yeah. it's not and, in the tape. <laughs> you know, no, and this year, and now you're getting to the real value because you talked yeah. about the, the system learning. I would like to expand to this. Where does this take us? I mean, are we going to get so smart that we're not going to need underwriters? I don't think that's the case, but. I don't think you do, but I think you'll be able to, um, I'll go back to optimize, optimize yeah, the process. I was going to ask you about optimizing. Now, it's a really broad term, but um, what optimization will let you do 
is take a particular process or activity and you pick an objective function, which is what is the thing I'm trying to improve? Um, and you tell, the, you tell the machine, this is the thing I'm trying to improve. These are all the inputs to the process that you can massage to make that thing better. But mm -hmm. here are all the rules and the boundaries about how far you can push these other factors. Uh, so you're telling the machine, these are the levers you can pull. This is how far you can pull them and, and maybe which ones you can even use together because you can't do all of them maybe. Um, but you've got to make this number over here as best as it can be. Um, and so that number could be cost. You could be trying to minimize cost of making the loan as much as possible. And here's all the different things you can do to the loan to make that happen. Or you could say, I'm trying to um, maximize speed, minimize the speed, make it as short as possible. Yeah. Or you could be saying, I'm trying to um, maximize the likelihood of performance of the loan and the borrower's ability to stay in it. That's a very different objective function. And the outputs based on those different functions will be very different in terms of what you do to a loan. So when you have all this data, you eventually could have a world where as soon as somebody starts filling out their loan application and providing the information about themselves and information about what it is they're trying to accomplish, you take all that information, you take information about what the lender needs to accomplish, um, and you, you select some objective functions and it comes back and it tells you, this is the best kind of loan to make with these features and parameters to meet this borrower's goals or to meet the lender's goals. And that's what you can do with optimization. Fascinating, Mark. Yeah, let me, let me ask the question. Obviously, uh, I don't know the details of your system, but when the system underwrites a loan, uh, can it complete a loan 100% on underwriting? And if it finds exceptions, what is the agreeability quotient? Meaning when an underwriter reviews those exceptions that they agree with what the system came up with or they, or they override what was said and improve the system. Those are things that for you being a user, uh, a potential user, I'd be thinking about. Absolutely. Those are very practical questions. So today, um, the platform is able to do the credit file analysis portion of the underwrite. Um, and it can do any kind of wage earner and probably I'd say about 80% of um, self-employed. There's a few things it doesn't yet read. Like for example, it can't read a divorce decree just yet. Um, so there's, there's little pockets of things where the system will simply say, um, this is everything that I have done and substantiated. I can see that there's this other piece here that I cannot do. So I'm issuing a condition for the human to finish the work here. Um, and so that's what it'll do. Um, to your question about what if they don't agree with what uh, Candor's um, technology says? Well, um, that's always a lender choice. We, we like to say that we, we aren't the ones making the lending decision. We're telling you um, if it qualifies and what's possible. And so it is entirely possible that um, someone would look at our output and say, I actually don't agree with this condition. I'm very comfortable with, with handling it the way I want to handle it. And that is their right to do that. Um, the impact that has is when Candor says that it warranties the work that it does, we just can't warranty something we didn't do. So if, um, if they decide to not to follow our recommendation and, and to choose their own, um, which happens, and there's plenty of reasonable scenarios when that happens, um, then that's just something we wouldn't be able to warranty. But other than that, it, it shouldn't disrupt the loan making process. Yeah, I certainly understand that. And that sounds like the way to handle it. It's, it seems to be amenable to our clients. So we're trying, what we're trying, we're trying to support them, but we're also trying not to block them. <laughs> you know? There are so many things that we talked about when we were at the, at your open house at the national conference, and we got some insights to where you're going, but it's even gone further in that, or are we in our pre-call uh, I got more insights to where you're going. Give us some little vision of what can we anticipate candor doing for us and for our industry? Oh, yes. Well, um, the good news is, is that our ability to perform an underwrite with a machine 
is highly portable. So there's no reason that it has to stay in the fulfillment space. Mm -hmm. So we're actually doing a POC right now to bring it into the POS. And I think we'll be, we will be having some official announcements about that um, before end of year. And then uh, hopefully some performance information about how it's going at the in the early parts of 2023 Q1. And then um, we have also been using this capability now in the post-close and pre-fund space. And so we're, we're talking to, um, we have a number of beta testers, but we are also talking to a lot of other folks that work in that space um, about how this could provide the same kind of lift that it has in the fulfillment space. And then we have a couple of other things um, in the works from our data and analytics division, which is mine, <laughs> my division, um, in terms of some um, ability to report out on the trends that we have seen on the loans going through our system. So we're going to have something inter some interesting um, data to report out, kind of a, uh, a look back um, at the past year, and um, some predictive models that are going to be coming very soon. The predictive model starts really getting exciting as you start looking for forward as to the value of a securitization, where things could go with a particular pool or how you pool certain loans together. So the implications of where they could go is gets really, really exciting. The great thing is there's predictive analytics that could be used at the front end of the process and at the back end. So all throughout. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I, th I look at this, we've always said when we were in originations, uh, and most originators say, if you're going to give a no, give it soon. Don't have a lingering drug out no, because that's what frustrates everyone. Did you did you not have the facts so you could make a decision earlier on? So the sooner we can deliver a no, I think is going to create a, a, a more positive user experience by and large. And so I think to the extent that you can integrate this into a, a good point POS even, or at least the LOS section where you're going through the data and collecting the data, be able to make that decision sooner is just some of the benefits of this. So I really see candor being an end-to-end -end solution. Let's talk about loan servicing. Mark Helm is probably one of the servicing. He's an expert at all at phases of Mark Street Station. We kind of pigeonhole him sometimes into well, this podcast into uh, the servicing because he's so well-known in the servicing space. But some the implications for loan servicing as far as it's a loan going into delinquency you you say you could predict that to a certain degree but then the solution of how to get that loan back on track has been left to the specialty servicers and you're saying that you actually have the ability to go in if i understand the implications of what you're saying or the way we're i may be able to solve that is that correct that's one of our goals is to solve that we've actually solved it before um, if, if you want to look up a, a research paper that Tom uh, Showalter and I published in 2011 in the Journal of Structured Finance, it's called, What Do I Do With This Loan? <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and it will explain to you the technology um, needed to solve this problem. Um, and the, the great thing is, is that um, the technology is public. Um, the, the algorithms necessary to make this haven't changed in 100 years, um, but the data inputs have gotten better with candor. So yeah. we're, we're going to be coming after this problem again. <laughs> yeah, Mark, that gets exciting for your, um, one of the things that are near and dear to your heart and that's loan servicing. That's for sure, David, any, any, um, you know, one of the things that had, having been an underwriter in a portion of my career, I would have to tell you that one of the things that generally speaking, underwriters and people that do problem solving lack self-confidence and to have a, uh, some modeling that can be done and some predictiveness that can be done to assist them is going to be great and also give them a solution which they can apply to or not because that's two people, uh, two people, uh, uh, a technical person and a real person agreeing on the same things or working out the differences to make things work. And that's exciting to me and it should be exciting for everybody in that, every aspect of the industry that this type of technology can be used for. Sarah, one of the things that impresses me is the diversity that of talent and skills inside your company. How do you get all of this to work together collaboratively working in a way to produce the quality product that you have? Well, for one thing, we have to. Um, there is no way to build our product without the input of all these different kinds of experts that we have. Um, and part of that is solved in the hiring process. We hire people who uh, collaborate well, um, who work autonomously, but also take responsibility well. And so what it has produced 
is um, we have a thing called a pod, which is a certain kind of cross-functional team. They're like a bunch of little SWAT teams mm -hmm. and they, they each have their area of expertise and they kind of, um, they do this um, very concentrated divide and conquer in terms of the way that they work together. Um, and um, that has been an incredibly productive unit that tur turns out um, very high quality uh, product and very quickly. So we have the pods, but the other thing is, is um, when we're solving problems, not just around the development of the product, but about the company at large, like what market should we go into? What new product should we make? How should we sell it? Um, when we're tackling those questions, we also use cross-functional teams and we have um, these collaborative sessions where we do pathfinding. So um, I think I mentioned before when Tom hires, Yes. He says, you know, he needs pathfinders, problem solvers, and executioners. <laughs> People who do execution, not yeah, execution. Yeah. <laughs> um, we understand and, what you do. Well, but the good news is, is that um, uh, pathfinding is a good collaborative activity for all kinds of people to be on because you're trying to make sure you understand um, the broadness of all the issues affecting the problem you're going to solve before you hone on and hone in on what you think the solution is. Because if you're too quick to try and jump to the solution, you could miss important information about what path you're going down. So, um, so we do a lot of path finding as a group, which I absolutely love because it means I get to have in-depth conversations with our underwriters, with our testers, with our engineers, with our, our sales and client success team. So, I get to know all these groups um, and what their point of view is and their experience and knowledge. Um, they, so they educate me. So I find it to be, it's a collaborative process where everyone ends up educating each other. Um, and then we figure out what the best path to go down is. Uh, and then we have to get into execution mode at that point and actually get it done. Um, but it's, I find it to be really exciting and interesting and it gives everyone a voice too. I would say it's like the democratization of ideas. If all the ideas in our company had to come from the top down, we would be nowhere. So um, they've got to come from everyone in the company. I love that. The democratization of ideas. Easier said than done. Yeah. Fascinating. Fascinating. I, I, Sarah, I think I want to uh, copy that. Can I use democratization of ideas? I like that. <laughs> Absolutely. Just... I'm pretty sure I probably heard it somewhere else. So, so but <laughs> please do. <laughs> yeah. Well, Mark... I feel like listening to you today that your uh, father could be my brother from another mother because uh, <laughs> the the whole concept he lays out and how he deals with people and the questions he asks them and all are, are some of the things I'm actually putting in a book I'm doing right now. And oh, it's really? really kind of amazing to hear a confirmation of kind of an approach I've taken on something that's been successful in my 45 years in management. So uh, it's always good. And to be acknowledged by a, uh, that I'm doing the right thing by somebody in technology. Oh, now. glad to hear it. <laughs> yeah. And then, and, and I'm seeing how this ties together. Like one of the things that I look at Sarah, is the complexities of human beings. I love looking at personality assessments, the various kinds that are there, how that affects the decisions we make, the best, where should we be putting people? There's a couple of tests that I can't wait to talk to you and Tom about when we're sitting together again. And just, I want to turn on the mic and just record it again, like we did when we were, when Tom and I were together. But it has like taking um, the six working geniuses. If you understand that, Google that. Take a look at Patrick Lencioni, it's the six working geniuses. Then take that and overlay that on top of, of what uh, Dr. Oh, Dr. Berkman did with the Berkman assessment as he's measured where we go under stress and how, how our behavior and our decisions go and change when we're in stress modes. And there's, there's three, ba four basic modes. One is where our interests and preferences are. I'm looking at a note over here to the side, what our usual style is your, our needs, and then where we go under stress. So those all of those are like a Rubik's cube and it makes for the complexity within the human. And that's what goes in. And much of what you guys are starting to codify in a, in a way, what the, the complexities of the human nature and the predictability of, of a simple thing, like, are they going to stay in the home? Are they going to make these, these payments and do so in a manner that's going to be a good investment for someone down the road. Fascinating. Fascinating. Well, you have done more work so far and you can, you can quote me on this and humanizing the technology process than probably most companies have done in their in, in their whole body. You've done it in your little finger. And I think that's just amazing. 
Yeah. Well, thank you, Mark. That means a lot to us because we we really are trying to be partners, not vendors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it comes through when you start talking with you, both you and Tom and Booker and and Ed. I mean, all all y'all, the, the whole organization. Can't wait to be get to know more all the way through all the way through your marketing with Sharon and the whole group. It's just this. It's uh, this is something special that we're witnessing here in the industry. Thank you for being with us, Sarah. Appreciate it. Thanks again, David. You've been listening to Licken on Lending, a weekly mortgage market update with your host, David Licken of Transformational Mortgage Solutions. Join us next week, and thanks for listening.